Going. Hello, hi, um, Dawn Cast. Uh, thanks for um, watching us. This is our fourth, is that right? Our fourth um, episode of Dawn Cast, and we've got a wonderful um, guest this morning, which is um, who is Angel, Angel Dixon. Uh, Angel is uh, an ambassador and um, manager for Starting with Julius. Advocacy manager, yeah. Advocacy manager with um, um, Starting with Julius. So you reached out to me. Um, uh, yeah, I think about qu quite a while back. Yeah, yeah. on LinkedIn. Um, so starting with Julius works within the diversity space. We work specifically with disability, within diversity and educating people and brands, mainly main people in mainstream media and marketing, um, on including and thinking about people with disability in that area. Um, so whenever we hear or see people doing exciting things in this space, I always just reach out and see what synergies we can find in our work and if we can work together and support each other through that because this area is something that is based on humanism and if we can't communicate and work together then everything would just fail and we'll never push anything further forward. <laughs> I, I remember when you reached out to me I'm thinking oh you know when you look at the profile of the LinkedIn and you think it's a model speaker I'm thinking okay and you know it, disability was as um um a subject that we weren't expert in uh, because obviously Dawn was more championing for culturally, cultural diversity and the lack of, of, of representation at that level of, of, of culturally diverse people. But my, in the back of my mind, I was always, um, I wanted to make sure that we were, we were inclusive, including men as well. So, so for us, it's not just, just women. Uh, and so when I th saw your photo and I saw your, the titles, I'm thinking, oh, she's a model. So what, where is a disability for you? Why, why, why are you in that space? Yep. So um, I suppose if I can preface what I say with this before I tell you about my own personal disability journey. Um, so I subscribe to the model, of the social model of disability, which is that we are disabled by our environment and attitudinal barriers um, and physical barriers that we encounter um, instead of being our bodies being the barrier or our bodies being the challenge. Um, so I acquired a physical disability 10 years ago. I was 19 at the time um, and my body is disabled. Um, I have paralysis in certain parts of my body and I experience different sensations in other parts of my body. So I do identify as a disabled person as well as a model and a speaker and a, div a diverse human being in general. Um, so I guess that's how disability comes into this for me. Um, on top of myself having a lived experience of disability, I also have a peripheral experience with disability. I have a brother who lives with disability. Um, he is nonverbal and so that gives me a uh, another look into diversity within disability and I have the opportunity to advocate for him as well as myself and for a huge area of our portion of our community. Mm. How do you think, um, you know, from my perspective, obviously we all have lived experiences, um, but obviously when you look across mainstream, you know, either the media, either um, through the leaders that represent us, uh, for, for us, the issue has been that, the, that yeah, decision-making policies around certain social issues, uh, it's not, the solutions aren't there because I, f I feel that uh, unless you have some form of um, representation from certain parts of the community, either dis from the disability sector or from a culturally diverse perspective, that you, in, you're an can enable the leaders to actually make decisions and policies or, or, or initiatives that could actually impact, Definitely. have an impact. And I just think, I don't think this, it, it's there and, and... It's not, no. Yeah. So um, I'm also an, act, an activist in the space of universal design, which is um, something that will help us achieve what you're talking about. So. Um, universal design is the idea or the concept of designing all of our spaces and environments and products to be as usable by all people 
to the greatest extent possible without need for specialised design or adaptation. Um, so I, I go and do a lot of speaking engagements and lectures on universal design concepts, not only within the built environment, but also within language and communication. Um, and try to express the idea that the human rights element of including the greatest diversity of people possible in any creative process only makes better products and better services for our society because we are inherently a diverse society. And if we're whitewashing everything and we're not including everyone, then how can we advocate for everyone in those processes? Um, so universal design and equity and understanding of equity. So equity is um, understanding that we are different. It's understanding difference and accepting it as part of the human experience. Um, so universal design and equity are two key elements to us actually achieving that goal of inclusion. Is there, can we have a universal design? Like how, how can we reach that universal I design? I think so. <laughs> you know. Um, I hope so. You reckon? Um, I think the things that I'm doing and the things that starting with Julius are doing, we obviously believe everyone in this room, you understand that media and advertising are our most powerful tools for changing cultural attitudes and challenging our society and pushing boundaries. Um, and the more that we can include diversity representation in that space, I think that's the beginning of of that mindset, that universal mindset that I talk about. Mm. Tell me how you got involved with starting Julius and how that got formed. Um, so Katja Malakias is the founder of Starting With Julius. Katja has three children on top of being a very busy lawyer. Um, I don't know how she does it, um, but she has two, uh, three beautiful children and one of whom Julius lives with a disability. And she always does the kids online shopping for their clothes and uniforms and all that sort of stuff. And one night she was just doing the usual shopping on Eeny Meeny Miny Moe's website. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that children's brand. No. <laughs> um, but they're a Brisbane-based brand. Unfortunately, they, they did shut down this year. Um, but this was a while ago and she realised while she was shopping that there was no imagery in front of her that represented her family values or her son. Mm. And she just kind of went, well, this is ridiculous. Like... I don't want to give you my money. <laughs> like, yeah, you don't deserve right. my money. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so she wrote them an email. And to her surprise, she got one back. And they invited Julius to come and be part of a campaign. And then they invited Julius to be part of seven campaigns. And by that stage, it had, years had passed and Julius had grown out of the clothes because he was <laughs> no longer a child that yeah. fit into that, that age group. Um, but by that stage... Eeny, meeny, miny, moe were now a diverse advertiser mm -hmm. and they had learnt what inclusion looked like in a campaign. And so Katja thought, well, if I've done this for one brand, why can't I just try for more? Mm -hmm. So uh, in 2013, she actually established Starting With Julius. Um, and then about a year and a half later, um, or two years later, I came on board. I was living in the, uni uh, in the United States at the time, in San Francisco, which is actually the heart of the disability rights movement. Right. Um, and I had really immersed myself in, while living there, I, d I, just, I spent so much time at Berkeley and at the Ed Roberts campus. Um, if you're not familiar with that, no. you should really look it up. Right. It still is my only experience of a completely universal design space. Tell me about it. How, how does it work? Um, so the pavers at the front door are actually channeled in a way that white cane users or people who are blind um, can feel the grooves to find their way to the front door, mm -hmm. um, which just is phenomenal. Um, then once you're inside the building, the, all the elevators have large foot level buttons for everyone to use. Um, they're especially important for people in electric wheelchairs. They can just push their chair up against the button that they need and it'll take them to whatever level. Um, just all of those really small but important differences in our design processes are 
something that actually make me feel I've, I've been in that building quite a lot since my first experience and as a disabled person in that environment I feel the most welcomed and included that I ever feel anywhere in any environment um, and, and what about what about the the rest of the the, the, the population uh, at that campus I mean does it feel like they has they had to adapt in some way or no or did, does it look like you know, uh, the path is a certain way when no. or the button is so, so big? The idea of universal design is that it celebrates both form and function. Um, universal design, inclusive design and design for all are all kind of labels that are used around fundamentally the same thing. I choose the term universal design because it, it kind of conjures this idea of the entire universe, universe yeah. um, which I really love and I feel it's really important to kind of help conceptualise the topic. Um, and yeah, it, it's important to not only create products for the greatest diversity possible, which includes disability, but also make them in a way that is attractive and mainstream in the way that everyone else gets to enjoy mainstream products. Um, and you said you haven't seen anything like that? No. So we certainly don't have a universally designed building in Australia or a completely universally designed building in Australia. Mm. Um, there are a few scattered throughout the world, um, but the Ed Roberts campus is especially, yeah, important in this whole mm, mm. whole area. Mm. Um, the building is actually named and was erected in memory of Ed Roberts, who was a disability rights pioneer in that space. Um, and to to quote some of the cringeworthy media releases at the time, it was in the sixties. Um, he was the first cripple to attend the <sighs> University of California. Um, and even that use of language is, is something that has changed. Um, the evolution of inclusive language has also happened since there's been an understanding of universal design. Um, could, could it be argued, like some people could say that we're going too far to become too politically correct? Well, Do you no, know what I mean? So I'm really glad you said that because... There's an article that has been released and it's about that. I can't remember the headline. I'll have to send it to you. But um, it talks about the timeline of inclusive language and how we actually started at a point after the Second World War of these horrendous atrocities against Mm. minority groups. Mm. And then language followed because our cultural barriers existed physically in the way that we were segregating and we were isolating people who were different. Our language and our derogatory terms started to spur from that. Right. Um, So we started with dignified language, which is uh, governments and leaders actually started to understand that there needed to be some dignity maintained within all people in our society. And so dignified language started to exist within a cultural space. It then started to exist within a gay rights environment and the LGBTIQ yeah, <laughs> community. Yeah, I know, I would that wrong. <laughs> um, and then we started to move into the disability rights environment. And we, I think there's this huge misconception that comes with the term politically correct. We've forgotten the fundamental understanding of dignified language and all that mm. means yeah. is bringing dignity to everyone. Yeah, yeah. And political correctness has, has kind of been born out of fear and lack of education. Yeah. So we've kind of got to this point of it was dignified language, now we've got to inclusive language, which again means we're including everyone in our society. Um, I use an example, a physical example, to try and help people understand this topic. Um, there's, I don't know if you've ever seen the the accessible buttons oh, on yes. walls yeah. for mainly for already existing buildings. So historic buildings will often need to adapt their building to allow everyone in. Yeah. And you'll often find these hideous looking giant metal buttons with a big wheelchair symbol on them. Yes, yes. That people with disability are supposed to push and then a door will open and then you can enter the building as opposed to other people being able to physically open the door. So there's that product, which is a Band-Aid fix. Mm. Then we talk about automatic sliding doors, which Mm. have a sensor that literally sense anybody. 
and then that will let you into the environment. That's a universally designed product. Mm. So if you think about those two products that exist physically and then you take that to language and we start to realise that there are some things in language that are hurtful and not inclusive to some people. Um, As an example, in a medical environment, there are terms that are used as diagnoses. So my body, I live with paralysis and the way that I walk is medically diagnosed as lame. And I also have spasms in my paralyzed muscles that are called spasticity. So my body is known as spastic. When those terms are used in a derogatory way, that diminishes part of my identity, that mm. they're who I am. Yeah. And that there's also a, a bit of a misconception or a confusion around the difference with disability and diagnosis mm. and then characteristics of diagnosis. So disability is our community. Disability is an external experience, as I said in the beginning. It's actually something that when we... When I stand at the bottom of a flight of stairs, in that interaction is where my disability lies. Universal design eliminates that barrier and my disability shouldn't exist in that environment anymore because those stairs wouldn't be the barrier. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. My body isn't the barrier. Um, That takes a lot, obviously, the way you analyse it you yeah. know the, the way that you've explained it obviously it takes um a lived experience to be able to uh, compartmentalize Definitely. those different experiences and how that can be interpreted but you know i mean we're dealing with as as you said people human beings here um and and talking about you know how could somebody think about this universal design if they have not had that lived experience exactly um and so how do you then how do we both in our respective um advocacy work really get this message to those that matters those that actually make the decisions to change it you know to make it more universal yeah so those that example of the two physical products of the doors is a really simple way to explain that to someone i talk about automatic sliding doors as I actually give examples of people and I say they benefit parents with prams, they benefit delivery workers, they benefit people with disability, they benefit pretty much anyone. I mean, I don't like making two trips with my groceries, so I don't have any hands to spare. Yeah. So there, that's a, a header that can fit every single person. Um, and that, that is a simple way to explain to people what inclusion looks like and what universal design looks like. Um, the more people we get to, the better. The more people in mainstream areas and leadership roles we get to, the better. We're starting with Julius. Um, How have you found that? It's been really interesting because creative teams and especially marketing teams are very rigid in the way they work and they're data-driven. And this idea isn't new. The idea of inclusion isn't new. It's been around forever. I mean, as long as there have been people, there have been diverse people. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Um, But it's just really underexplored. So we don't have any data. I mean, we have data on people with lived experience of disability, but even that is skewed because there's a stigma around the word disability and people are scared to identify. So until such time as we can start changing those stigmas, We're not going to have true representation of data. So when we go to a marketing meeting and we sit down with someone, it's really difficult to come at it from just a humanism point of view and go, well, do you know someone with a disability or do you know someone of a diverse background? And then they go, yeah. And you go, well, would you like to see them in advertising? (laughs) (laughs) What did they say? (laughs) (laughs) And And then all of this you know you can see their mind their kind of yeah. crack yeah. and they go well yes I understand but my boss said that I need to meet these numbers and yeah. you know it all well, kind of thing, starts though, to show isn't that, isn't that the thing it comes down to the numbers exactly it comes down to the revenue exactly it comes down to the business case so um, what we've had to do is we there I mean starting with Julie's we don't create the data we don't come up with the data we actually align ourselves with people that do um, there are a lot of people that do are heavily involved in disability studies here in Australia. 
a lot of the networks that I'm aligned with in the US have some really interesting data um, that I use when I'm lecturing and teaching, teaching, <laughs> <laughs> teaching. Um, and we do have a, a really compelling number that I share with people. And 53% of our global market has a direct connection to disability. And there's a couple of other things as well. But 53% of our global population has a direct connection to disability. So that means you either have a lived experience or you have a connection through family or friends. Um, which means that our global market has the buying power of China. Mm. Mm. So if you're not marketing to us, yep. you're missing out. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that's, that's where you're kind of trying to get those numbers, the men exactly. making those num- you know, decisions to say, look, this is where the potential market is, your customer base. Exactly. If you actually really build this inclusive um, thinking mm. into your, your decision-making processes. Yeah. The next step too is also, so it's, it's fine for us to outwardly help, to, well, to help brands outwardly portray diversity. But what's really important then is that they start freaking out that internally they're not diverse. Yeah, I know. Um, so that's something that there has been a challenge. I mean, uh, both Target and Kmart have been really great with that. We, I mentioned we, we have yep. worked with Target and Kmart. Um, but it, it's, a funny, it's a funny place. Where do you start? It's kind of the chicken or the egg. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's but right. I mean, we always say you've just got to start somewhere, start somewhere and you'll start to conceptualize this topic in your head. We can help you through it and you'll get there. Mm. You're better off to start now than not start at all because there will come a point and we're getting to that point actually where people who aren't doing it are actually going to find themselves in some pretty hot water if they don't start doing it soon. Mm. I mean, 10 years ago before you, obviously, you, you would not have that knowledge that you today have mm. in this space. That, that Once you acquired, you know, when, when you had the paralysis, mm. when did you start thinking about moving into the advocacy space? How, how did you deal? Well, first of all, how did you deal with it, that the fact that you were an able body to then, ha- then having to go through the experience of having... Sure. Part of your body. Um, so I actually, part of inclusive language is that we don't use the term able-bodied. Right. Okay. I'm learning something. <laughs> <laughs> so don't use able-bodied. Sorry. Because it actually implies that our bodies aren't able. Right. Uh, like. Yep. And I know that the word disability does imply that anyway. Yeah. Um, but, but is that less? The word disability. So it's better to use disability than able body. Uh, so I use the terms disabled and non-disabled. Right. Um, The word disabled, unfortunately, we have all these weird euphemisms that go around now because people are scared of using the word. Yeah, they are. And the more that we're scared of using the word disability, the more that we segregate ourselves. Right. Um, It's not a scary word. Right. It's actually really upsetting to me. I do some peer support work within primary care. Yep. And it's really upsetting to me to see people who are scared of identifying with their community. Mm because of a stigma that someone else has placed around a word like it's ridiculous yeah. <laughs> it's just it's it's really disheartening for me because there is so much support and community within the word disability mm. um and it should be a source of pride mm. all it means is difference yeah in the way that cultural diversity and every other form of diversity yeah is different yeah it shouldn't mean anything more than that yeah it shouldn't mean that we exist in a culture, we, we currently exist in a culture that has very low expectations of people with lived experience of disability. Um, when we, we actually add a lot of value mm. to mainstream society um, in the way that we have a lot of money to spend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and we are, when we see our values represented in a brand, we're very loyal customers because it's very rare to find people in this environment that actually acknowledge us. Mm. Um, so we're important. We're an important part of this diversity piece, um, as well as mm. just being important people in society. Yeah, you know, right. we yeah. just happen to be human, human beings. beings. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's the whole thing at the end of the day, isn't it? Exactly. 
Yeah. Um, that, that humanism piece is really important to me. And sorry, I've forgotten your question. Um, just basically going back to when you were... Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. yeah so, so, so how would I then ask that question to you? Do I then normally... Would I be... Um, what is the correct way to ask you? So how, how did you make the decision to be in advocacy in that disability space yep. before you became disabled? Yep. That's the right That's way? That's perfect. You know what is interesting because the, the, you, the disability is actually is fine. It's interesting, it's, and I'm just digressing a bit here, but the word disabled actually has a more... I, I feel guilty. I don't know if that's the right word to use. Yes, but the, the word isn't what's driving you to feel that. It's probably what society has exactly. put onto that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, our words only have power and meaning if we give them yep. that and we, we change the meaning. Yeah. I mean, the thing... Uh, and the thing... See, I think every... I, I believe the mainstream, if you can put it that, we can actually label that, have changed terminologies to identify groups of people in society over as yeah. it evolved over years, right? Yeah. I know that, for, ins- for instance, with the culturally diverse communities now, it used to be the NSBE is was called the non English speaking background. Oh right. Yes, it was used to call NSBE. Yeah. Or well, and I think ethn- ethnics first, ethnic, and then NSBE, and then now cold. Yep. So the evolution of language, as you can see, from ethnic to NSBE to cold. So for for the disability sector, um, I think y- you were able to say disabled in the past, but I think there was then at one stage it became able body and non-able body, I think, the language change. And then now we now have to use disability. So can you see how whoever shift and make those changes? So, so what's happened in that space is that the human element, the human rights element has kind of been able to come back in. And there are a lot of people with lived experience of disability that are advocating for themselves in this space. We don't have special needs. We have basic human needs. And when someone identifies my needs as special, why are my needs any more special than your needs? Mm. In the way that when I'm getting on a Virgin flight to come down to Sydney and they announce to the entire world that anyone with special requirements or special needs, please come forward. And then I have to stand up and with my cane and I become this physical representation of what special needs is. What do you do in that instance? Do you well, stand? Well, I have to take it. I have to get on right. because, you know, <laughs> that's the world we live in right now. Mm. What should be used in that case is anyone who requires some extra time, please come forward now. Mm. Mm. Because I, I, talking about special needs, um, you know, school, because I've got a son, yep. um, 14-year-old son, and um, they often ask, you know, when you send on excursion, what are, it's got special needs. Yep. So just take it. And it's interesting because I've, I think I shared this with you as we were driving here, is that my son has got a scar on the back of his head, um, which I'm very conscious about and I'm, you know, having feeling that guilt, uh, as we mentioned. And so I actually, when it says special needs, I'm thinking, well, he does not have special needs, but there are certain things about him that they need to be mindful of. Exactly. Um, but then that's where I can, I just put a burnt scar. That's what I put special needs, a burnt scar, and then needs to be mindful that how he is actually, um, you know, how kids would bully him or, or treat him yep. differently. Um, but yeah, and so yeah, it makes you think he doesn't actually have a spe- special needs, but. No. Um, I, but I don't t- take the school up for it or anything. But it's interesting that you mentioned that, that whole, the special needs yeah. and how the language is not so that inclusive then. Even though maybe from the mindset of those who've dis- designed that, 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 that language definitely. is to be include, inclusive. Exactly. So the, all these little incremental acquisitions of knowledge along this journey have been really important in this movement. And in the same way that you've had an evolution of language in the cultural diversity space, and that's been important. I mean, with knowledge comes more knowledge and better knowledge and everyone grows from that. And it's the same thing in our environment. Um, 
And I, I think it's important to remember that the language isn't changing. I mean, it's evolving and all these yeah, things have been, yeah. have been really great steps. It's not changing, it's evolving. So we're learning more. Um, and the more that people with lived experience of disability are able to come forward and advocate for themselves, the more we will start having a universal mindset and parents can kind of back off a bit. Mm. I mm. mean, parents are really great. I mean, Katja is a mum of a person with a disability and her advocacy is, it comes from a human rights framework. She comes from the understanding that we are human first and then disability is layered on top of that. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, in, in, I've, I've ca- I met up with this amazing woman who is a, a senior manager in one of a, a corporate um, space and one of the things she mentioned to me, because as we're talking about inclusion and diversity in leadership, is that she said the piece about the inclusion piece for her is that she's a, a parent of three kids with, um, she used the word special needs, mm-hmm. Um, because of the different disability, um, um, yeah, c- certain 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 disability sort of. Um, so they have diversity within disability within disability. Yeah, they have, so d- all d- three of them. Yeah, all identify three as having a different, different disability. Yeah, okay. that's right. And for her, the challenge for her in the workplace is that to progress in in in, in the workplace is how do you get the senior or CEO to actually understand that she has these responsibilities so therefore how when we talk about inclusion in leadership how where does she fit in do you know what I mean how can she so I think what comes in there and actually what I probably should have added into the language point is that idea of equity again yeah Yeah. so just understanding difference and -hmm. accepting it as part of the human experience is key for those CEOs who need to look at each individual within their company and go, well, yes, all these people may actually be in the same role, but they're also human first. Mm. On top of that, they're different. And so how can I find some equity for each of them in their positions to understand and accept their different lifestyles, their different challenges, you know, mm. all that kind of stuff. How can we Do you think a other? CEO would actually stop and think like that? <laughs> one day, one day, we oh will God. get there. And I don't How want do we to, get there? And I don't want to generalise and I don't want to say that there aren't people out there who are doing that already. Yeah. But for the majority right now, it seems to be that they're not. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Exactly. And how do yeah. we get them to get there? Exactly. Yeah. You know, what do we need to do to get them to get there? We need to do what we're doing right now. Talk about it educate find as many people as possible and scream it from the hills <laughs> yeah we still haven't gone back to how you just going back again to well, how you know, i got I, there I mean, you know we just, <laughs> uh, and yeah so being have, having had no disability and then moving into the disability yep. space how did you possibly for me there was absolutely no question that i would probably end up here um, uh, something what do you mean no question that you would end up here? Uh, as in in this space, in this environment of advocating for my community. Right. Um, the first thing I did... So I've, I think something really important to preface with this conversation is that keeping in mind that disability is just a layer on top of who you are. I remember someone said to me once, I was in a, a network in San Francisco with this wonderful, he was kind of one of my mentors. And he said to me, you know, I was a little shit before my disability and I was always going to be a shit with disability. Like it's just, <laughs> if, if you're annoying and you're depressive and you're a horrible person before disability, you're going to be that afterwards. You don't automatically become an inspiration and, you know, this inspiration, I'm not sure if you're familiar with inspiration porn. Uh, no. Are you familiar? No. Okay. So there's a... There's <laughs> inspiration a, porn, oh God. <laughs> there's I a, know there's food porn. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I love food porn. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't love inspiration porn. But, All right. Um, so so there's, a, there's a really wonderful Australian 
activist called Stella Young. Unfortunately, she passed away a few years ago, but um, she has a wonderful TED talk. So if I can send you the link in for anyone who wants to look it up, it's Stella Young TED talk. Um, and it's called I'm Not Your Inspiration. And it talks about, uh, Stella talks about how disability doesn't make you exceptional, but changing the way you think about disability does. And she talks, she speaks specifically to the social model of disability and that idea of that our bodies uh, and our diagnosis are not a problem. It's actually interacting with our environments that become an issue for us. Um, and she talks about, I'm sorry, where was I going? We were talking about uh, in, um, inspirational porn. Oh, of in, course, inspir inspiration porn. porn. So she talks about this idea of inspiration porn, which is that... I'm sure you would have all seen images or there's this one that I particularly hate, which is just an image. It's not of a person. It's just of a wheelchair sitting on the sand at the beach. Right. And it's like this sunset in the background. Right. And then it says, your day could be worse. Oh, God. Right. So that's an example of inspiration porn. So we're objectifying one person for the benefit of another. Uh, Does that make sense? Okay. Yep. yep. Um, so this this weird thing that has come out of because my body is disabled and yours is non-disabled for some reason that makes you think that my day is harder than yours mm. and you know what my day is actually pretty easy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this morning i got driven yeah. to a warehouse and i'm talking at a podcast yeah. like i'm sure there's some non-disabled people out there that are having a really rough day that's today that's right exactly <laughs> and i'm <They're> fine <laughs> Um, and yeah. I'm not, I'm not, and nor do I want to be someone's inspiration because of my disability. Mm. What I want is to be taken seriously and I want my message to be heard. Sure. Take inspiration from that, but yeah. don't take inspiration from me getting out of bed in the morning, yep. you know? Yep. 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 Um, so it's, you know, it's interesting. It's true. I mean, for years I have never s shared my experience as a refugee. Mm -hmm. You know, living in a refugee yep. camp and, you know, coming, you know, spending years there and then um, arriving here and, and then s rebuilding our lives. Because I just think it's just pro perhaps just that's just the journey that ha happened to me. And so I just do it. Right. And so here I am. I have to make the most of, of life now and, and rebuild. And obviously in the last in the last decade or so, being more active mm -hmm. in the space of diversity and inclusion I had to share my obviously my journey where I how I got here and and, and you know what mm. I'm doing now, and they're amazed like the number of people who say amazed at my um, story and that they've never heard first of all f from a first hand experience of a lived experience of somebody who's been a refugee mm. that you see it on the news a lot, but you haven't spoken and, and, and met a person and spoken to somebody. Exactly, you have that same stigma yeah, of, like, yeah. you came on a boat. Boat, that's right, you came on a <laughs> boat, you know, and, and I thought, oh. and at times I'm thinking, you know, it's when people ask me to give talks, I'm thinking, do I bring that element in? Because I don't want that to identify me. It's the same thing as c cancer, yep, breast cancer exactly. survivor. I, I don't want that to identify me. That is an experience I've had, and that has given me a certain, you know, uh, resilience perhaps, yes. But it's about how to interact with people uh, for them to see of my ability to Definitely. contribute, you know. Definitely. So something that's as important as our language with inclusion is the framing of, like, the inclusive framing. So framing your experiences mm. in a way that... Um, that is framed as an experience, as mm. part of you, as something that has made you aware and enlightened in that space mm. instead of uh, identifying with it. Yep. Or, I mean, you, you do identify with yep. it. You yep. are a refugee and yep. that is a power for yep. you and yep. you are a breast cancer survivor and that yep. is also a power for you. Yep. But, yeah, the framing is really important. And mm. first you need to reframe that in your own mind before yeah. you can express that to other people. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, anyway, going back to... Um, yeah. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> how long did it take there? Uh, your, your, what happened to you? How did that, that impact you personally? Yes. So 
I was always oh, going to... it's not starting to rain. <laughs> can you hear it in the hear. mic? It sounds nice on the TV. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to come closer to the mic because it's oh, so okay. rainy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was always going to be... I don't know. I, growing up, I was always, you know, the, the one that fought for whatever was right. Yeah. I was always the most outspoken on what I believed was good and right in the world. And yeah. that was always going to be me anyway. So after disability, that was never going to change. Yep. So I did have a few years where I, I molded myself to this non-disabled world. And I really felt that... I had to adapt my body and my new normal to what society allowed for me now. And I always wondered why I was so angry and frustrated. It was so exhausting for me to, you know, I'd go to a cafe and I couldn't order a coffee independently because one, I couldn't get in because there was a one step entrance into the cafe. So then my partner at the time would, you know, help me through the door. And then I couldn't stand up at a counter that was so high and the the pay station was fixed in one place. So if I was using my wheelchair, I actually couldn't reach to pay for my own. So you had a wheel you were in a wheelchair at one stage. I always use a wheelchair. So um I use whatever mobility tool helps me that day. My body's different from day to day. Right. Um if I know that I have a long day ahead of me or I'm going to the shops, I always use my wheelchair. Right. Um, some days I use only my manual ch- manual wheelchair. Some days I have a little motor that I put on the back. Mm. Um, and then every day I use my walking cane. That's the one thing that I have with me all the time. Mm. Um, it's, also, it's funny that you say that because it's something that's important for me to have for stability. But also if I walk freestyle, which is what I call it, um, my gait is typically confused as something else so people will often assume that I'm drunk Um, so I find that my cane is actually a socially acceptable way to identify disability or for other people to identify my disability Um, which helps with those attitudinal barriers from other people so but do you wish sometimes that you could have if you if we talk about a socially um, constructed like you know, trying to have that universal mm. in- inclusive perspective, would you ha- have loved to be in a position or in a, in a society whereby you can walk, as you said, so the without reason, having to, the cane? The reason that I do what I do is so that people who come into this world uh, with a congenital disability or people who acquire a disability, just like I did, can live the way they want to live and identify the way they want to identify without having to worry about a stigma from someone else or an attitudinal barrier from someone else. And there are days where I choose not to use my cane, but there are days when I'm usually out with my husband and I hold my husband's hand. Um, And I'm usually wearing active wear and, you know, I kind of, it's not something that I'm super conscious of anymore because actually I, I really don't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's great, isn't it? Um, but yeah. in, in the beginning, you know, I'd, I'd have to make myself look very well put together just so that people didn't think I was drunk. There was actually one experience that I had where I was walking down the main street of my hometown, which is a small town on the east coast of Australia. Um, and mum was holding my hand. And at that point, I was very unstable on my feet. I'd probably only been out of hospital a year. And so I needed mum to be holding my hand. And this person came towards us and they were yelling at us and we couldn't really figure out what they were talking about. And they actually weren't talking about my walk. They were talking about the fact that we were two women holding hands. Oh. (laughs) So that was just a whole nother layer on top. I'm going, okay, so they think I'm gay. (laughs) What, like, one, what's the problem with that? And two, who does that? <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> There's just so many things going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that, I think that was also very confronting for my mum. That was one of her first... Um, Encounter with the public. Yeah, I think. I, I mean, all of my friends and family see the way that people look at me. 
and question me every day I actually have a blog where I talk about some of the interactions that I encounter each day um and I mean it's challenging everyone takes it on board differently it kind of rolls off my back now I don't really think very much of it because what comes with really absorbing that social model of disability is understanding that it's everyone else's problem it's not yours (laughs) um yeah so that that part of that journey was challenging for me but it also in the way that you speak about your resilience through your experience your life experience it also taught me things that I wouldn't have known otherwise and I wouldn't be able to advocate as well as what I do for my community right now if I didn't go through those experiences um and it's not as if those experiences have stopped I have just learned to deal with them deal with them differently what was the most what had the most impact after you had a disability was it friends family or the public that you had to confront it was myself um, we live in a culturally, uh, I'm going to use a term that is used a lot in the disability rights area. It's not a, a word that I like to use. You'll understand why when I use it. Um, a culturally ableist world. Um, so as I said before, I like the term non-disabled and disabled. So I th- we're inherently ableist we're we're born into this society that tells us that our bodies or people with disability are broken it's their bodies that are the problem and that non-disabled people are the epitome and they're the best and Mm. you know we are to uphold that standard (laughs) Mm. Mm. (laughs) that's really boring (laughs) it's just not how it is i mean people who are born non-disabled are temporarily non-disabled with age comes disability. Yeah. With advancements in medical technology comes disability because we survive diseases, we survive accidents. And that's wonderful. Yeah. So why is disability such a negative thing yeah. in this environment? Um, so it was myself that, was, that I found the biggest barrier. And I remember being really confused by why I was so angry and why I was just so confused in this space. I couldn't... I couldn't understand why I couldn't find a place for myself anymore. And when I really started absorbing absorbing myself in the networks in San Francisco, in that disability rights movement, I I found it. It Mm. was like the social model just really opened my mind and I just kind of went, this is it. I completely understand. Universal design is where I belong. Um, This community is where I belong. Um, and I need to do something about it. Australia back then did not have that space or that culture to make you feel that you belong? Certainly not where I was living, no. Um, And also, I I find in Australia we we don't have that passion. Mm. There's something about the US that when people immerse themselves in something, they, they also have more people. Yeah. So... There's, there's passion and in San Francisco there's rallies and, wow. and people get out their picket signs and go and stand on Capitol Hill and actually protest for things and as a creative I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, I don't know, I, I just felt the need to come back to Australia and try and, mm. and be that change here. Um, the difference is you, isn't it? Be, exactly. Be, 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 be the change <laughs> that you want to see. You. <laughs> the difference is you. Be yeah. the change that you want to see. Exactly. But I suppose when, once you got back here, what was the journey like? How yeah. was that? So I had, I guess I went into a little bit of a slump <laughs> coming back to Australia. Um, How long have you been back now? Uh, two years or a little under two years. Um, and... Yeah, so I came back and I I was trying to figure out, one, how I can apply all the things, all my new knowledge into something here in Australia. And I knew that it was marketing marketing and media and fashion that I I could see the change happening quicker than anywhere else. I mean, I could certainly tackle 
other areas, which I do. I do have a lot of other projects that I work on. But these are certainly the channels that I identified would have the biggest impact and targeted impact. Um, And then I actually, someone was writing an article about me and they contacted me and they said, actually, you know what? I just wrote an article about someone else that I think you should meet. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, oh, okay. And it was Katja. Right. And so starting with Julius had only been around for about, a year or so and we connected and I think the first conversation we had we were on the phone for about two hours Wow! (laughs) and ever since we just you know have you met Katia oh yeah oh okay yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so we because sometimes I mean obviously our relationship was online yes definitely (laughs) and it's just you know recently that we met but we communicated and we spoke about you know this whole inclusion piece by online yeah so yeah yeah Yeah, no so Katya and I meet up wherever we can we both kind of go on we call them ad inclusion missions yeah so when we go and meet with marketing teams or you know whoever will listen really yeah um we we've come and had meetings in Sydney and we kind of it's a bit of teamwork. We do them together. Um, Kaj is wonderful because I'm, I have a bit of the creative side and the, I don't know, yeah. the, the drive <laughs> yeah. for different areas and that kind of younger space. Whereas Katja is the lawyer and she's the, the brains of the thing and yeah. she can speak so well yeah. and <laughs> puts these wonderful slides together. It's great. Um, this year we have a lot of speaking engagements, so we'll get to spend a lot of time together this year, which will be really good. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I really, I'm very grateful for my connection to Katja and what we have kind of found in each other. I feel like I can support her in ways and she can certainly support me in ways. We also have a lot of um, ambassadors that are also out in the space um, kind of advocating for us and doing our work and doing wonderful things which is great yeah so I, I feel like I've really found my my place mm. where do you where do you think inclusion and disability that whole um, space how that's going to evolve for the dis- disabilities you know people in disability sector do you think do I think, don't know. You think it's going? To, you think people are <laughs> taking it up? Like wherever you talk? Oh, definitely. Um, mm. So, what would you like to see happen? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. No one can ever know what's going to happen with the evolution of this. We, no. we just don't know. Um, the only thing we can do is hope for the best. I mean, it's so. The thing is, it's going to move forward with. Something that Katja likes to say is that there is no risk with this. It's always going to be a good idea to include a person with a disability Mm. and outwardly represent our community. Mm. Um, Target and Kmart can attest to that. The responses that we have had from campaigns, especially... So last year, I was the first adult model to be included in a national television campaign in Australia ever. Right. So in 2017... The fact that that has never happened blew my mind. Yeah. Um, in Australia? Are you talking about... In Australia. Yeah. But you would have seen it overseas when you were in, in San yes. Francisco? Yeah. Um, so Target US and Nordstrom US have included people with disability in their campaigns for a very long time. I think Nordstrom have been doing it since the 90s. Mm. So they've got some really great knowledge and data around that. Um God, we're slow then, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've got data. Yeah. So um, it's actually been – so Target and Kmart, um, yeah, have been really wonderful. And the responses that we had to those campaigns was just overwhelming. My inbox was full of emails from the creative team that had they'd been sent from just people in the community, both disabled and non-disabled, mm. just talking about – Mm. how they identified with the campaign, how it's something that they didn't even realise they were missing until they saw it. That's right. Even even on shows. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Even, even on, and that's one of the things that I know that we are championing as well and there are other groups as well that are trying to get the media. I mean, if you watched news programs, 
you 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 think the world is perfect. Yeah, exactly. You know, one coloured, one skin. There's a one really look. great statistic. Um, I think that's the Glad report actually, where they talk about roles in Hollywood. Yeah. So I think it's one percent of roles in Hollywood actually call for disabled characters, and of that one percent, only five percent are played authentically by someone with a disability. Yeah. I have no doubt. Yeah. And so... Look at coloured people sometimes. Exactly. Or, or, so or we col- know... Culture. They, we they had know. a white person. <laughs> I think coloured, no. And I think in the, in, in, back in the old days, they had white person... Blackface. Black, blackface, exactly. yeah. So we now yeah. know that that's not okay. Yeah. So... And I'm actually... I'm not an advocate for, you know, we can only employ actors who have lived experience of that experience yeah. because that's not inherently yeah what acting is no that's right <laughs> like, exactly we should that, that's that's not it but until such time as we have equity within the casting process we need to have some quotas yeah. we need to actually start having some authentic representation and so that will be the start of us getting to a place where yes sure a non-disabled actor could probably play a disabled role but right now we actually can't get good... Like, there are so many amazing disabled actors out there, but they just can't get through the casting process because people won't accept them. Mm. People so, don't even look for them. Exactly. Mm. So until such time as we can get to a place where those processes are universal and inclusive, we need to start screaming mm. that authentic representation needs to happen and it's not okay to have the... The equivalent yeah. of blackface mm. happening in our media and in Hollywood. Do you get thro- does it get thrown? Um, have you come across or have people said to you, "Well, that's playing identity politics"? Like that's <laughs> about you know, like it's just because of you're a disabled or a cultural person doesn't mean that we, you know, like everybody should 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 just you know work with the system and 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 uh, you know definitely. But mm. I don't listen to those people. <laughs> <laughs> the system's broken. <laughs> I mean, in the way that our language and everything has evolved, in the way that we evolve as human beings, mm. our systems need to evolve. Yeah. It's archaic that yeah. these processes that we've had forever, we're just expected to just live with it. It's a big challenge though, Angel. I'm <laughs> doing it. <laughs> I'm doing it. <laughs> Are we going to be able to change it, you reckon? <laughs> Definitely. There are, I mean, I'm just one little person who's working on this. There are hundreds, thousands, millions of me out there. And they're people who are doing it locally in their communities. They're people who are doing it on bigger scales than I am. I mean, there are some people in Hollywood. I mean, if you watched the Golden Globes this year. No. Oh, the Oscars, sorry. The Oscars, I know. I've heard Um, about it, but I haven't, I didn't watch. So have a look. Look up Inclusion Rider. So there was a really wonderful element of the Oscars that was specifically for disability, about disability. Right. Um, And there are some wonderful directors and people in that space doing things around this. And the more people that are voicing this Mm. and just sharing their ideas, whether their ideas are along the lines of what Starting With Julius is striving for or not, whether it comes from that kind of inclusive language, human rights element, it doesn't matter. Just as long as disability is coming to the forefront, we can work with that human rights element along the way. Mm. You know, it's just that awareness right now Mm. that we need to see everywhere. Um, So we'll do it. We'll get there. (laughs) <laughs> well thank you i mean gosh that's such a um i think it was a, a really insightful um you know conversation for me anyway in terms of language use and um to understand that that sector and uh, obviously now also with the national disability mm-hmm. insurance ndis um a lot of those groups are, are, are you know because the 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 um these individuals are now responsible for their own um th- through the program individual with disability have to look after themselves like or, or make a decision to to ha- how they're going to spend the money and how they're going to you know be a human yeah. being in the society in society which can also be a challenge there's actually yeah. a lot of 
mixed emotions around yeah. around the NDIS at the moment. Um, I obviously have a really unique position on the NDIS because not only of my lived experience with disability, which is a person who is very independent and able to advocate for myself, but I also have the experience of my brother who lives in a care home um, and who isn't able to advocate for himself. So I have two very different experiences with the NDIS. Um, and I, Yeah. I mean, it's very new. Yeah. Yep. We've got a way to go. Yeah. But, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> so with your brother, though, how do you then... Um, what are some of the issues, do you think, for a person who cannot advocate for them, themselves, having have to care, obviously spend time with your brother what are some of the things that you believe us as a society should you know should take into consideration and should be mindful of it's just the same things that we've just talked about Mm. i mean gas experience is difference that's that's Mm. what it is Mm. um it's really hard for me to go out in public with my brother and experience those attitudinal barriers on his behalf. So I often, I will often be approached when we're just hanging out. Sometimes we'll be having lunch, which means that I will be feeding Garth. Um, and people will come up and pat me on the back and going, you're doing such a good job. And you don't, you think You're that's... such a wonderful person. And I'm like, I'm sure you have children. Mm. I'm sure you have siblings. <laughs> you would have fed your child at one point. Mm. It's literally just adapting to what people need. And my brother just happens to not be able to feed himself. So that's what I do to help him get food in his body. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. It's not special. Yeah. I'm not doing anything different to what anyone else would do. Yeah. Yeah. He's my brother. Yeah. But then at that, at that moment, yeah. at that moment, do you then stop yourself and think also, look, these people are, who have come say, oh, how wonderful you are yep. to do this. So there, do you have that internal deep, uh, kind of um, voices that say, one, that, that's critical. The other yep. side said, look, okay, let's understand this. this oh, these obviously they're not, yeah. obviously have got no idea of that experience. Definitely. And see this as yep. something that needs totally. to Totally. Yeah. And I mean, those... Um, I mean, that's what I do. When I go and I stand on a stage and I'm speaking to hundreds of people, I empathise with them. I mean, and in the way that I explained that we're all brought up in this world and even I had to unlearn everything I was ever taught about disability. So, I mean, we all come from the same place. So I have empathy and understanding for every individual who has a different idea of what disability is or perception of what disability is. It doesn't stop those microaggressions from happening, though. So, you know, I'm, I'm entitled to feel that anger and I'm entitled to feel that confusion in those moments because, mm. you know... Mm. I just am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's what I get to do in those yeah. moments. They can't take those things away yeah. from me. And I know that people don't intend that. Um, but that's why in those moments I often don't educate people in those one-to-one interactions because I understand that the things that I do publicly and on a greater scale are doing more. Um, so I allow myself that space and that time in those individual moments to go. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Just be you. <laughs> just, mm, I don't have to educate you right now. Just yeah. go away. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just know that that empathy and that understanding comes through in my work in a greater scale. Mm. Yeah. Mm. What do you think is your message to, I mean, obviously for us at Dawn, we're very, very conscious and, and very um, passionate about shifting that leadership representation mm-hmm. um, to have our leadership pipeline more inclusive and diverse and not just having a bunch of white Anglo men sure. making <laughs> decisions uh, and groupthink. Yeah. Um, what would your message be to those leaders who are really designing our society, mm. who are shaping our state or our nation, um, our businesses? What 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 message would you leave them to say to start really shifting that mindset i have two yeah (laughs) do you think it'll land (laughs) (laughs) one is diversity is who we are inclusion is how we treat each other 
So that really brings that humanism into it. For someone to actually just look at themselves and go, oh shit, that's right. I'm a human. <laughs> I have a bit of an ache in my hand today. That's probably going to limit some of the things that I do. And being mindful of the fact that, you know, they're going to have to adapt what they're doing that day. Um, take, bringing that humanism into their own human experience is all I ask. That awareness of what's going on in your own environment and then understanding. There's a, a thing that I was talking about with someone recently, which is the double triangle or the double diamond effect. Mm. So you have kind of like this holy grail in the center that is your target market or whatever. And they're people that, you know, exist in this kind of area of privilege and they're, they're people that are often non-disabled um, or temporarily non-disabled um, they're people who exist in the society that understands that you know this is what the world is and we're all very proper and we're all very whitewashed yeah. and wonderful and then when you start going out to the outsides of the, these diamonds we talk about the people in the middle even they experience barriers so I, I always talk about flying so getting on an aeroplane, I mean, no one likes getting on an aeroplane. Oh, There's yeah. so many barriers for every single person. But then when you start thinking about these points of these diamonds, be it cultural, disability, you know, LGBTQ, IQ, <laughs> <laughs> um, any kind of minority, they have extreme experiences of those barriers that exist in the center. Mm. And so when you start to think about yourself and bring awareness to your own barriers. And then you start thinking, oh, well, shit, like that must be extremely, well, you know, yeah, in, in whatever industry. And I'm not talking about that inspiration porn element. I'm not talking about taking it from like a, oh, shit, my day could be worse. Mm. I'm talking about it in whatever industry you're in, identifying that that target market that's right here is actually very limiting. Mm. And then doing that double diamond thing and going okay well we have some really extreme experiences out here that we probably need mm -hmm. to do some focus groups on yeah or we need to start including those people in our design processes so that this we have one diamond mm -hmm. you know and yes people are always going to probably have some extreme experiences but they're things that we can fix you know that we will know about because we're thinking about them mm -hmm. um so that, that humanism element is really important. That was a very long description, sorry. That was a very good one, though. <laughs> I think, you know, those men in there were thinking, right, it has not occurred to us that we actually, right in the centre here, and there are all these extreme experiences on the corner here, <laughs> they probably hadn't, hadn't thought of that. Yeah, exactly. And it's true. You just don't think about no, it. I don't. mean, it's a generational thing mm. because, as we talk about, this is an evolution of the process. So it's a generational thing. It's also a privilege thing. You know, if you've grown up non-disabled, you haven't had any lived experience or peripheral experience, you're never going to know about it. It's not anyone's fault. But when you become aware of it and you don't do anything about it, it becomes your fault. Mm. Um, so then my other thing is just... Oh, wait, I forgot my other thing. <laughs> <laughs> two. What is the I message? Had two. <laughs> I did have two. It'll come. It'll come. <laughs> I've forgotten. You, said, you talk about inclusion and diversity. It's not both of them? No, that's one part. Inclusion is who we are. Diversity is how we treat each other. Yeah. Ask me the question again. So basically, <laughs> I was going to... So I was saying to you, like, basically, you know, what would the message be to those those people? Because our interest is in the leadership piece. Oh, I remember. Ah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> leadership. <laughs> it's leadership. No, so it's actually the business case. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So take the humanism side of it. Do what you will with it. I mean, that's the part that I think is the more important part. But if it takes money and it takes data, then whatever so take the business case remember that 53 percent remember that if you're not representing us or you're not including us you're actually missing out on a on whole market. lot of money yeah <laughs> so, so there you go it's the dollar sign exactly it's, it's the money guys <laughs> exactly yeah yeah so that's that yeah. <laughs> well thank you so much angel it's so great to have you and i hope that you know as you go along this journey um would love to continue to definitely do things together and it's going to take a village we need to support does. each other that's right and um it's great to have that um 
collaboration as well because as I said we're very we want to be inclusive and um, and I think as you said if we can create a similar similar community that you experience in in San Francisco here mm. in Sydney or in 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 Australia it'd be great and maybe we can start that definitely yeah so thank you thank you thanks for having so, me so guys hopefully you um were so you know say hello to angel there or say bye angel <laughs> <laughs> uh hopefully you tune in to dawncast um podcast a hashtag dawncast podcast and let us know what your you know your, your what you think let us know your you know what you think um angel's perspective is and what your perspective is around inclusion and disability the you know positive or inclusive language use and would like to hear from you and um yeah hear what you your your experiences your lived experience be it you know being a culturally diverse or have a disability experience or any other experience and would love to hear from you so see ya next ex- at the ne- on the at the next episode <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I think I rambled a little bit. Oh, <laughs> <all right. laughs>